I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupontier. And today we will we'll be discussing parasitic helmets. Wow, finally something I know something about. <laughs> <laughs> All of parasitic helmets in 20 minutes. Can you do that? Yes, but you won't be able to understand it because I have to speak very fast. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best thing I can say about parasitic helmets is to define what a helmet is first. Oh, that's perfect. And then to give you some idea of how pervasive these infections are. A helminth is a worm. And there are three different kinds of worms that you can become infected with, typically. There are round worms, like my finger. There are flat worms that don't have any segments, like my hand. And there are segmented flat worms that if I put my hands together in a series of hand motions, then you would get an idea of what the segmented flat worms are. The round worms we refer to as nematodes. The flat worms that are not segmented, we refer to as platyhelminths. And the segmented flat worms we refer to as tapeworms. And I think some of those terms are probably familiar to most of you. So I spent most of my adult life in a research lab working on a nematode helminth. It was called Trichinella spiralis. But that's a rare event in this country to become infected with trichinellosis. It's, it used to be very common, but no longer. Due to public health laws and regulations regarding what you feed to your pigs, pigs no longer in this country are the main source of that infection. But there are plenty of other infections out there. First of all, let's just say that we've learned a great deal by studying normal human beings. And one of the things that we've discovered is that we all share a common set of microbes that live between the webs of our fingers, on the backs of our hands, in our armpits, throughout our gut tract. In fact, we have microbes everywhere, both on and in our body. It's called our microbiome, and it's the thing that defines us as a human entity. One of those entities in our microbiome is a nematode. It's the, one of the most common infections in the world. It's called pinworm. And this is a worm that almost everybody encounters during the act of growing up to an adult. So if you want to talk about helminths as some exotic feature of perhaps third world countries, which a lot of people portray helminth infections as being, but that's not true. They skip over the fact that part of our normal microbiome during our growing up stage until we reach puberty is a nematode called Enterobius vermicularis or pinworm. So I'm always fascinated by the, by the discrimination that's uh, even microbiologists that study yeah. only viruses or only bacteria or only protozoans, they have an aversion for talking about helminths. Just, Would it be fair to think of them as neglected? They're called neglected <laughs> tropical diseases. And some of them are because we don't spend enough money on them to try to get rid of them. Many of them, not all, but many of them are transmitted because of unsanitary conditions that exist in the local area where these people live. So yes, many of them are associated with less developed countries or the lack of sanitation contamination of food and water, food handlers, <clears throat> some are even transplacentally transmitted. The fact is that at any one time throughout the world, and now that there are 7.6 or 7 billion of us, about two thirds of that population harbor helminths other than Enterobius vermicularis. And I, um, I was going to jump in because this is overwhelming, right? <laughs> this is somewhat overwhelming. It is. Um, when you think about the number of different parasitic worms that you might be infected with, the number of people that are infected. Okay. So, so what we want to do, we have a whole nother series actually on parasitic diseases. We that do. 40 chapters, 40 videos that everyone can feel free to, and to a book access. a a guide. <laughs> yeah, and a book, Parasitic Diseases, now in its seventh edition as we're recording this series. Sure. Um, so what we're hoping to do is give people sort of a nutshell. Yeah. And when we say parasitic helmets, we're going to be focused particularly on the soil transmitted helmets. We are. They're called geo helmets. The geo helmets. They're called geo helmets. And I had a, 
a wonderful mentor while I was um, growing up as a parasitologist. His name was Dr. Harold W. Brown. And he was the parasitologist in, in residence at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And he, old school, he was from Sheboygan, Michigan. Um, he got his MD degree and his Doctor of Science degree and his MPH degrees. And he was a very humble individual that loved to entertain through knowledge. And one of the entertainments that he had was to describe the geohelminths. There are three main geohelminths that infect huge numbers of people in the billions. That doesn't seem possible, but it's true. There is Ascaris at Lumbricoides, about the size of a, a ballpoint pen, and looks basically the same. Imagine a pink ballpoint pen. That's the size of Ascaris. There's another worm called the whip worm. It looks, for all intents and purposes, just like a whip. The tail of the worm is the handle, and the, the head of the worm, which is quite long and sinuous, is the whip part. And then there's a third parasite, and it's called hookworm. Those three parasites, he used to refer to them as the unholy trinity. They were often found together. They're not all acquired the same way, but they are associated with human fecal contamination of the environment. And to hear him tell those stories about the effects of those three parasites on the general health of people living in those endemic areas was like listening to David Attenborough talk about the burrowing owl of northern um, Arctic Circle and how it uh, hunts down its prey of voles. It was fascinating from start to finish. And I've, I can't capture his spirit of the way he described these, but I have his passion for it. And it, it rubbed off on me. And I'm committed, and a lot of others of us are also, all of the authors on our textbook are all involved in some way, engaged in trying to prevent the spread of these seemingly intractable infections. Why can't we get rid of those three parasites? Why do you think that well, we I think rid of Well, I think that that's an excellent question. And um, it reminds me of some of the other um, topics we've addressed where a lot of it has to do not with a lack of medicine, but a lack of a social economic context. Right. So a lot of these are diseases of poverty. They are. A lot of these are diseases of limited resources with Correct. regard to hygiene, yep. which we bring up, um, places to um, get rid of our wastes without the waste then getting back into our uh, population. True. And, I, and there's really, I think as a clinician, there's two approaches to the soil transmitted helminths, the parasitic helminths we're discussing today. One of them is the targeted treatment for a specific individual. And the other is the, um, the mass campaigns, the mass drug administration campaigns. Sure. And so um, we'll talk a little bit, um, we have a expert here. It's this sort of, now we're getting into an area where we're sort of, uh, our bread and butter, so we're to speak. leading to our strengths, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that it's important for a clinician to know when they go to one of these areas is what are the local um, governmental organizations, what are the local non-governmental organizations doing with regard to targeting of the soil transmitted helmets? Exactly. Are there scheduled deworming programs? Are there programs where they're look, looking at doing things about toilets? Um, oh. Well, go ahead. You want? You seem like you want to jump in. I, I want to say something about. I don't want to jump into the toilet, <laughs> but I want to talk about what happens in some cases when good intentions result in bad results. So the good intentions in Ghana was to install um, composting toilets, and there was a group from Colombia, of all, of all places, called Engineers Without Borders. Okay. And I know the woman that headed it up, Trish Culligan, was her name. Probably still is. She led a group of students over to Ghana. They investigated a problem. They've got soil transmitted nematodes, helminths, I should say, and the best solution to that is to control the spread of human feces. Okay then. And everybody said, great idea. Even the local people said, we'll help you. So what they did was they installed, I don't know how many composting toilets, but perhaps 20 or 30 in a large community of several thousand people. And they left expecting the rate of geohelminth infections in that community at least to go down. Mm -hmm. Instead, it went up. 
It went up. So they went back and they discovered what happened was that the people living in the local area use human feces as a fertilizer. And installing composting toilets gave them only one place that they had to go to to get the feces in order to use it to spread out over the fields to make their crops grow. And this is true for about half of the world. Half of the world uses human feces as a fertilizer. So if you want to control the spread of helmet infections that are transmitted to soil, you can't recommend controlling feces as one of those things that you don't do anything else with it. You have to have a substitute for that in order to make the program work. Yeah. And, and, and they discovered that. So that's just an aside, but worth no, noting. No, I think that's a good aside because we're going to be approaching um, our soil transmitted helmets on the individual, on the mass drug campaigns, but I think also maybe broader is to say the public health approach. Sure. And because so many people sure. in the world use um, human feces as fertilizer, right. there's a big push, and we've actually started adding this to our um, chapters in our parasitic disease textbook, treatment. There's ways to treat human feces that actually are effective in reducing the, um, the spread of the helminth diseases. That is true. So not only do we want to look at mass drug administration, we want to look at public health interventions that yeah. decreases exposure. That's right. And then, as a clinician, you're occasionally going to run into individuals who actually have acute symptoms right. of, of soil sure. transmitted helmets. Unfortunately, particularly children. Particularly children. Um, and let's talk about, so ascaris. Um, often we'll see a young child with a distended belly. You may notice a mother comes in with a group of children and one of them has a distended belly and is even though older or the same or similar age to the other siblings might be smaller. And so we'll even see in the same household different various um, degrees of exposure and infection. Right. And so often, you know, you'll, you'll treat them. Um, the history, you can often ask the children, and I don't ask them if they see worms, I ask them how big the worms are. Ah. And I know at one point someone said, oh, well, they, they go into this toilet and it drops into the darkness. Children don't always use the toilets. They're out, they're playing, eh, they'll take care of their business, and then they actually see the ascaris worms, which are these macroscopic worms. Um, sometimes with hookworms, chronic infection, you may end up with anemia. Yeah. Um, whipworm, what, what do you think about whipworm? Again. Well, it's got some association with a learning deficit. So if you acquire that at an early age, and say at the age of five, and you grow up until you're a teenager, even if you got drug treatment at that point and you had no more whipworm, it's possible that the formative years of your neurologic development have been stunted by an endocrinopathy, which Peter Hotez, one of our authors, uh, has yet to find the cause for. <clears throat> Pardon me, it's, it's a, an area of broad research that needs to be addressed more directly and more rigorously because it's a major cause of learning deficit throughout the world. Yeah. So these are, not only are these um, problems for the individuals that the clinician might be treating, but particularly for ascaris, we'll see a lot of individuals go into these communities and a single ascaris female can produce 100,000 eggs per day. So this can be on the currency, it can be all over the place. So ascaris in particular is a problem to the, to the populations that you might be trying to take care of. Um, but it also can be a, an, a risk for the healthcare providers. This is true. So just to give um, a little bit um, of treatment, we talk about targeted therapy. And in children, um, we're going to say six months to two years of age, um, we might use 200 milligrams of albendazole as a very common um, therapeutic agent. Um, you may do the single treatment, but in heavy worm burden, you may do three days, right. and you may repeat this a week later. Yes. Um, and this is particularly for hookworm. Three days is more important, where your ascaris may be one dose and another dose eight days later. Right. Um, think about the timing of exposure, if this is someone who's come from an endemic area, because the eggs are not gonna be destroyed. So if you ingest the eggs, then they're still um, in the maturation process you may need to retreat later. That's true. And this could be a number of weeks um, from exposure to um, having an adult. Um, when individuals get older, so we'll say greater than two years of age, then we'll go up to a 400 milligram albendazole dose. And for scheduled, so mass drug campaigns, 
Um, this has actually changed slightly. Um, in a lot of communities, um, it was every three months, but there was recently an increase in cost. Mm -hmm. And so some communities have dropped to an every six month right. because this could be a major, um, major use of resources. What he really means is that the reacquisition rate after drugging is very high. Which means that the sanitation aspect of this problem didn't go away just because you used a drug. And I think that's, that's key. In a lot of ways, the mass drug campaigns are reducing the helmet burden, but you're not curing the community. Oh, yeah. And it's economic growth, it's that's sanitation, right. 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 it's access to clean water and food that that's are right. critical. Right. Um, and also not being exposed to feces where you might sit or play or walk or so again, these are neglected diseases of the neglected populations. The smallest tip of a very large iceberg of information. <laughs> yes. So if you enjoyed this, we do direct you to the um, Parasites Without Borders website. Yep. And please go ahead and learn um, all you want to learn about all the many exciting parasitic helmets. All right. Thank you for joining us today. Yep. We'll see you again. <laughs>